Hi, Dr. Cooper here. Welcome to day two of our course. And today uh, we're going to have a, a little bit more in-depth uh, look at the historiography of world history and, um, and think about um, how the discipline came about. Uh, and uh, our main reading for today is from uh, Patrick Manning's book. Uh, and I'm going to base my uh, initial thoughts on, uh, on, on that book. Um, so um, I think one of the main things that comes out of the Manning reading for me is um, his focus on interconnections between people rather than the dominance of one group over another. And I think this is an important focus because it helps um, world historians to get away from um, the need to explain everything uh, in terms of political history and military history, which group is taken over which group, uh, you know, battles for leadership amongst kings, etc., which can be interesting in um, a small amount to liven up your course, but sometimes if that's all your course is, it can become rather tedious for the students. Um, and, and it doesn't really get at what's so great about world history and that is looking at these interconnections and being able to see new things in the history of the world. Um, so Manning uh, offers us a definition of world history which is uh, world history is the story of interconnection of connections within the global human community and um, you know I think this is a good working definition surely there are others which are good and emphasize different things. Um, but one thing he does talk about is the use of terminology and even within his definition we have to think about uh, things that we need to define, we need to be very aware of terminology. So for instance, what do we mean by connections? Do we mean, we can only talk about things that are directly related. So trader A sees trader B and passes on idea C, and that we can talk about. Uh, and a lot of those connections are very ephemeral. Um, and how things are connected when they sort of occur in the same, in two different places independently, but are the same kind of thing in the same kind of um, uh, circumstances, but without any direct evidence of these people's being in connection. So if, even when we start to think about these words, we have to be very um, careful. And one of the words that he uses is this word human community. And he argues that it's not until the 20th century that we can even really conceive of the world as a human community. And um, just a side note on terminology, uh, very often words like civilization, societies and cultures are used in interchangeably. And I would really advise you to sort of drop the civilization uh, part from uh, from your vocabulary because that's a very loaded word and there's lots of problems uh, with the word civilization. Um, it began with uh, as a term to be part of civil society, meant that you were somebody who had a stake in society. And it, um, it, it also originates in its... Uh, um, in its original Latin uh, from the word city. So we're talking about uh, um, people of a certain class, people that live in, have cities, live in cities. So we're already uh, being quite exclusionary. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes while I'm doing this. It's probably quite rude. Um, it's already quite exclusionary. But then when we get to uh, the 19th century, the French talk, start to talk about a civilizing mission as part of French imperialism, you know, to bring uh, the light of their civilization to the dark continent and we can see this term starts to get problematic um, even if you add an X S to it and don't talk about civilization as opposed to barbarism but talk about civilizations we're still problematic because it means uh, that some places are civilizations and some places are not civilizations because some places are civil and some are not um, and so I'll, I'll talk numerous times about uh, getting away from the idea of uh, a course about great civilizations, you know, a week on China, a week on Egypt, a week on India, which to many people seems like world history and actually isn't because it still keeps these societies in their separate boxes. And it doesn't talk about peoples that, for example, don't have monumental architecture and don't have a, a written language very often. Um, Societies and cultures are less loaded and uh, they're different terms. Societies mean people live in one place, 
where that's what I how I think of it anyway. Uh, whereas cultures can spread beyond one geographic location. Uh, for example, if we think about the Latin culture, uh, the Celtic culture in in Europe, uh, which um, spread uh, very um, broadly throughout Europe in um, in the Bronze Age, Iron Age period, and um, it spread into Britain and Ireland certainly. And we think of Ireland as a Celtic society. Um, but evidence from DNA suggests that there's very few actual Celts from where this uh, Latin culture originated came to Ireland. What came to Ireland was Celtic culture and the uh, uh, indigenous Irish adopted Celtic culture. So when we use things, you know, we have to be very, very careful. This, you know, are the Irish Celts? Well, they're allowed to call themselves whatever they are, but by blood you'd say no, but by culture you'd say yes. So these terminologies uh, think uh, deserve a lot of thinking about. And uh, this was the thing, something when I was in uh, began graduate school it used to really annoy me people go on forever and ever about what a, a term means and now I understand the importance of thinking around it because sometimes in thinking about terminology we're actually defining a lot more than a word we're defining very big concepts that are attached to it okay so uh, Manning talks about in, ex, internal and external uh, foci and uh, he, in, in terms of an internal what he's looking at is um, a, a local events that can be better explained by a global context one of his examples for example is the rise of empires in, um, in different places around the world the Habsburgs and in China um, and then uh, looking at why these empires seem to arise in different places can be better explained in the global context by an influx of silver from South America. So without understanding that global context, and if you were looking at the Habsburgs, for example, you wouldn't understand completely what was going on within the Habsburg um, um, Empire unless you looked at the um, global context of that local event. And this brings in uh, comparisons between different places and also looks at knock on effects, how a, a, a massive event in one place can have a ripple effect, which produces different local effects that can be on a global scale. But we wouldn't understand those local effects unless we looked at the global context. And he talks about external um, problems too, um, prob uh, ideas too. And these are changes that take place beyond anything you could define as a national or even an imperial border. So big changes in environment, um, things like the uh, Little Ice Age in the 14th century, for example, uh, impacted the world in a different way. Sticking with the 14th century, of course, we have the Black Death, a massive disease event around the world, uh, which in the places were affected uh, caused the death of between a third and a half of the population. Um, in evolution, this probably goes back into the earliest parts of my uh, my historical interests, but certainly uh, we could talk about one of the major events in human history uh, being uh, the development of uh, linguistics and cognition around 50,000 years ago, which allowed um, you know massive increase, uh, leaps forward in, in human societies um, and in, in technologies. And the important thing about this is it brings in other disciplines. So a lot of the advances in uh, these areas have come about uh, through um, incorporating other disciplines such as anthropology, ar archaeology, even um, musicology, um, art history, um, 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 all kinds of things, so I can't think of anything else off the top of my head, uh, that you can bring in from other disciplines. And this is really one of the engines that's pumped world history forward. Um, so his foci are somewhat similar to what we're talking about, transnational history and uh, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary foci. So his internal events um, uh, sort of imply what's happening to the local uh, from other areas, transnational areas, and his external change, uh, ex uh, changes are somewhat like uh, multidisciplinary foci. Okay, so one of the things he, he talks about uh, being important about world history is the way it can and has um, cast well-worn narratives in a new light. Uh, for example, uh, many of us knew about and taught about, talked about as part of a Western Civ uh, course, uh, Western Civilization course, uh, Atlantic slave trade and the Industrial Revolution. 
But it's only when you start to look at the Atlantic slave trade and the industrial revolution in a global context that you start to see uh, in the, how, how they're actually connected, how the money from the Atlantic slave trade came to power the industrial revolution and how some of the uh, engines and machines that were uh, involved in uh, trying to increase sugar production actually came uh, to be in, involved sometimes by the same engineers to be involved in the early um, industrial revolution uh, which was more focused on mining and cotton. Um, and another way is a uh, thing that's in, he says is important about world history is that you can start to put unconnected events um, together. I mean, events that don't have a direct connection. So a person A B was not in, uh, got in conversation with with person B. Um, so, for example, the origins of agriculture, which took place in many different places around the world, uh, in India, in China, in the Middle East, in places like New Guinea uh, and in the Andes, all had uh, agricultural events. Um, but when you start to think about these, even though these people were not directly in contact, you start to think about um, the world as a series of events and systems that take place and how these are, are connected even though the humans themselves are not directly connected. And then we often talk about knock on effects and one of the biggest ones of these is uh, crowd diseases uh, which um, um, became common in the um, old world largely from crossover diseases from large animal contact but of course these diseases were unknown in the new world uh, where there's not so many large animal domesticated animals except for the llama and when these crowd diseases uh, were brought to the new world uh, by the conquistadors the effect was uh, as we all know devastating. So some key points from Manning which I think are worth, worth highlighting before um, I finish here are the historical connections among entities and systems often thought to be distinct. Okay. Um, his historiographical analysis is excellent uh, from its roots in ancient history to the present day. That's the bulk of what his chapters are about. And, uh, you know, I advise you to read them, skim them. Um, you do not need to memorize all this stuff, but get an idea of the scope of, uh, of what we're talking about and the story of the development of, of world history. You will notice if you're reading this on Google Books, there are a few pages missing, but it doesn't do anything to, to diminish what you're supposed to get from this reading, which is just this broad uh, picture of how and why they feel developed. Um, one of the things I like that he talked about are um, uh, the fact there was a revolution in historical evidence um, and not too long ago what was considered to be his, his sound historical evidence was factual evidence namely diplomatic documents but nowadays almost anything and everything can be related to the past one thing I work with for example is saints lives which uh, would not have been considered uh, good material for historical evidence not too long ago and very often um, this evidence is gathered by non-historians, by people who have specialities in, uh, in other disciplines and, um, you know, uh, archaeologists, anthropologists, um, musicologists, etc. Those are the ones that are bringing this new material to light, which now historians are, are working with. And the other key point that I think he, he, he makes is that by the mid 20th century, we start to have changing notions of the word community, going back to what I was saying earlier about terminology. And, uh, you know, we would start to maybe just to start think then about the world as a global community. Of course, this, this uh, feeling and thought has increased massively, especially with the massive explosions of communication technology in the last 20 years. But certainly this has its roots in about the same point in time where people are starting to want to think about a world history again. OK, those are my thoughts on Manning. I'll give you a separate video which will tell you about uh, the um, assignments for today.